The eyes of the world are now pointed towards the horrible war in Ukraine. But right on the other side of the border, a concerning trend has been taking place for some time already. The Russian government's grip on freedom of speech is tightening day by day, restricting the everyday activities and professional life of Russian citizens. Although laws restricting freedom of speech is not a new phenomenon in Russia, it has now taken a turn for the worse. The most evident one is the newly adopted law that can give up to 15 years in prison for expressing and spreading opinions about the war that doesn't follow the government's narrative. Later, an additional law was adopted saying you could be punished for spreading fake news without any clear guidelines on what these fake news are. We've seen some of the consequences already, with journalists and media outlets being forced to shut down or put themselves on hold for writing about the war. But these new restrictions also have a huge impact on other professions, such as in the academic field. And this is the topic of today's episode of The World Stage. My name is Marie Furhaften, and with me today I have three experienced researchers who have followed the situation in Russia closely. First, we have Aude Molin, a lecturer in political science and specialist in Russian and Caucasian studies at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Second, we have Mark Youngman, senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Portsmouth. And last but not least, my new colleague, senior research fellow, Julia Wilhelmsen. Welcome to the world stage. I'm very glad to have you all here. Thank you. So, preferably, we would have had Russian academics in the studio today, Uh, telling their first-hand experience on what it's like as an academic in Russia right now. But as the situation has become as severe as we see now, this is almost impossible without potentially putting someone at risk. But Julie, you have been doing research on Russia for almost two decades and you wrote your PhD thesis on Chechnya. So naturally, you have a lot of Russian colleagues and contacts. So uh, tell us, what is the situation like for a researcher in Russia today who's not supporting Putin's war in Ukraine? I think for for most, it's the shock of what has happened to their society and waking up and discovering that actually uh, Russia is at war against Ukraine uh, and understanding what repercussions that will have for their own personal life maybe in the first place. And then for academics, I think it's a move from having lived in Uh, a situation where certain uh, themes have been off limits or there has been limited freedom to do research on certain fields to now what is a, a state of emergency, kind of a martial law type uh, situation. And Odd was mentioning this morning that on the very uh, first day of the war, Uh, a very emotional letter was uh, published by, I don't know... Hundreds, yes, I don't Hundreds know. of, of academics, uh, academics stating that this, you know, we are descending into an abyss, which is, I think, describing the, the feeling uh, people had, that the understanding, despite the lack of information of what kind of situation it is. And then, of course, uh, academics are not only... Uh, they are normal people, but they're also very conscious uh, people. Very many are, of course, for democracy and freedom of, of speech. So that meant that in the days straight after the beginning of the war, they both used their pen to write down and publish their uh, criticism of the war. Some of them took to the streets and participated um, in the demonstrations. And of course, now they face potential uh, a potential legal process for what they did. Uh, so what we hear from our colleague, colleagues, some have already had their flat searched because they did a posting on Telegram. Uh, some have actually been in prison short, for a short while because they demonstrated and are already fleeing. Uh, and then uh, in general, I think it's the feeling of unpredictability of what is coming next for Russia and in particular for their professional life. Yeah, so it's safe to say that the, the, the everyday life of academics in Russia has become very hard. How was it before the war? I guess it wasn't all good and, uh, up until the war either. Like, How was it some years ago, 10 years ago? I 
I think for those of us who have worked on the uh, second Chechen war, which started in 1999, uh, the situation we're in now is very recognizable in terms of uh, not being able to express alternative explanations, narratives on what the war is about. And I think that is, uh, if you look at that period since Putin came to power, the wars actually uh, created step by step a more limited space, which also affected academics. And then I think we would agree amongst us that there is a kind of breaking point in 2011, 2012, when the Putin regime faces demonstrations in large Russian cities for the first time, where maybe in particularly uh, history as a discipline is being instrumentalized to create unity around the myth, which is also a reality, of uh, the heroic uh, fight against fascism um, uh, uh, during the Second, Second World War. And in this process, uh, science has also been instrumentalized and used to propagate the, the, uh, the Kremlin narrative. So it's, it's the, the attempt to use the instruments and the pressure you have uh, against in, to mobilize the, also the academic sphere. And at this time also uh, the foreign agent laws were introduced in 2012. It's a way for uh, the government to silence certain groups. So first it concerned basically uh, the civil society organizations, human rights organizations in Russia, saying that if they receive funding uh, from abroad, they are obliged to register themselves as foreign agents to uh, the Russian Ministry of Justice. So they made these lists uh, and they are obliged to call themselves as foreign agents. So these laws have been widened, uh, but in fact, they didn't concern academics, the educational sphere before uh, last June, I think it was. Uh, so 2021, we have more laws now, which we'll, we'll return to probably, but all these laws can be used as an instrument to take out uh, the people the regime feel they uh, uh, want to take out. So it's important to understand that there's a there's a longer story here. And um, I don't know, Mark, you had you had some points on the Russian Academy of Sciences and how it was yeah, yeah, so the, affected. The foreign agent law isn't merely a mechanism of, of control. It's also a mechanism of discrediting alternative voices, because once you're designated, you then have to proclaim that statement. So if you listen to any uh, media or read any articles by um, Russian media outlets that have been designated as foreign agents, they have to start off with that bold disclaimer and it becomes a way of discrediting them. And I think what we're seeing in an academic sphere, it's not isolated from the broader trends that you see in, in Russian society. So you've got in the, the immediate kind of the last few months, this kind of rapid deterioration of, of the situation. Uh, rapid deterioration of, of freedoms and what people are able to say, silencing these these alternative voices. And in, in terms of the situation for Russian academics, and if you're against the war, you're working in a very polarised environment. So you're isolated from some of your own colleagues who are going to be pro-war. But then you can put that in the longer term perspective, because as Julie said, from 2011, 2012 onwards, you see this gradual repressive turn, this gradual subordination of all of these different voices, different actors to the state in some way to increase these mechanisms of control. And in 2013, I think it was, for example, um, there were reforms of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and they were very controversial at the time, because essentially they were seen as eroding the independence. It established a new federal agency to oversee the academy. This was directly answerable to the, the president. And it really blindsided um, academics at the time because there wasn't consultation about this beforehand. And all of a sudden there's this new mechanism of, of control, mechanism of influence. So over time, those voices that are critical within the Russian system and those voices that are critical within Russian academia 
uh, gradually finding the space in which they can operate constricted more and more and more. And this goes in line with that, those changes of law that you're seeing, more and more laws being introduced that, that restrict the ability of people to speak. And I guess one thing are all the laws, but the other thing is sort of like a, a shift in, you, you talk about mechanism of control. And uh, what I'm, I'm curious, is it now a case where everyone is sort of telling on everyone Are we heading back to sort of the Soviet era of, of calling out colleagues or friends or neighbors? I am very cautious uh, regarding any comparison. And when saying a return to the Soviet uh, time, I would be very, very cautious because the history doesn't repeat itself exactly the same way. And there were very big transformations uh, within these 30 years. So, but you're right when uh, uh, telling that of course we are witnessing some similarities what we see is that some scholars uh, have to self-censor what we are saying that among those who left i received some emails from colleagues who tell me it will be worse and worse and i can't consider um, coming back to Russia now, and also the pressure, the pressure internally. For example, a colleague of mine told me immediately after the invasion, so she, she wrote me an email, but writing that uh, students, some students recommended her not to uh, express her uh, thoughts and her analysis through email. In university, the number two, The vice rector is affiliated to the FSB, so uh, conferences or some events, some research, some academic studies are under pressure, under control, and it was already in place. For example, LGBT and gender studies will, uh, were already fragilized. Mm. Social sciences are under threat and were already step by step uh, under uh, pressure. Uh, natural sciences also regarding some collaborations. And since February 24th, of course, there is such an acceleration without any international link, international collaborations. There won't be any research, any academic research. Academia can't work without academic freedom. Uh, regarding your question about Soviet, habits or Soviet style, the very fact that, for example, March the 18th, many students in many universities were encouraged, were invited to join the meetings in support to the uh, Crimea's annexation. We say annexation, they say reunification. And it is a very Soviet style uh, practice, which was already in place in Chechnya when uh, it was necessary uh, for the authorities to fill the stadium and that students were uh, supposed, but were very uh, strongly and uh, forcibly invited to attend the stadium until three hours in the night to fill the stadium students. And if they did not, their grant would be cut off and or their exam would be cancelled. So you see how the pressure penetrates the study and what should be academic freedom, but what is already mm. under pressure. And I think the point that Ord makes about self-censorship is a really important one, because in the post-Soviet context, up until this most recent, very kind of repressive, almost martial law type situation, self-censorship has been one of the main mechanisms of control in, in media, in, in academia. People work out what the rules are of what they can say and they self-regulate what is acceptable, what isn't, where the red lines are. And it's not just us, I think, who don't know what the situation is. I don't think anyone knows what the situation is. Russian academics don't know where the red lines are at the moment. And in those circumstances, in that increasingly increasingly repressive environment, that leads you to take a very naturally conservative position. You would you basically operate according to the worst possible scenario because you don't know where the rules are. So mm -hmm. even without the government arresting academics or directly imposing or using coercive mechanisms, 
people will self-censor. People will decide, actually, I don't want to engage in those partnerships mm. anymore. It's not good for me. And then eventually they might decide, actually, I can. Now I understand the rules. I can work out how to get around them. But in the short term, they adopt that very conservative mm. position. So I think self-censorship is as important, if not more so, mm. than actual formal censorship mechanisms. Yeah, and you mentioned people are fleeing. People are leaving Russia because they are, are scared. And, you know, this, this so-called brain drain uh, is, is quite severe for a country. And this is not the first time that Russia is experiencing such a brain drain. And what happens to a country when it is experiencing a flight of academics, for instance, such as we see in Russia now? I mean, it's hard to, hard to say what, it will, what the actual impact will be for Russia. But I mean, this is again, a long-term phenomenon. So I mentioned those reforms of the Academy of Sciences, and there was a survey afterwards of academics, and I don't remember what how many people they interviewed, but it was something like 70% of them said they were concerned about the future of academic freedom in their country. And large numbers then talk about wanting to either leave the profession or leave the country. And... I imagine if you could conduct reliable surveys now, which I don't think you can, but if you could, you'd see large numbers, if they've got the opportunity to go abroad, they will. And that has that effect of just further removing the critical voices, because again, the government doesn't have to silence voices if they're not there anymore. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting, some of the reactions from um, civil society actors, human rights activists, even someone like Navalny himself saying they'll stay in Russia because the moment they go abroad, it becomes very easy to paint them as that foreign agent. They they lose credibility. And, and so even if those critical voices find support in the West, even if through things like Scholars at Risk and these programs for, for providing a, a, at least a temporary home for scholars leaving the country, those voices will have less credibility, they'll have less resonance. And I think part of the thing that you see in Russia as a whole is this, this shrinking of alternative voices, not just marginalized from society as a whole, but marginalized from the Russian elite. Mm. And so the Russian elite has become something of an echo chamber. And that explains mm. a lot of what's happening. But one of these alternative voices has always been the academic voices. Mm. And so I think removing that is, is directly detrimental even to the Russian regime itself. So, so some are leaving, some are staying, but they are, uh, many of them are, are scared to say anything at all, uh, leave their positions as a lecturer, etc. Um, so would you say, is this sort of like the end of academic freedom in Russia? Is that what we're seeing now? No, I think that uh, we can't say that there is an absolute end because people are alive, uh, the freedom of thinking is already existing and people are very smart, clever and able to imagine some strategies, but the pressure, the conditions are very, very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that our duty is to keep the channels open to collaborate with our free and courageous colleagues. I think that we must keep these channels to keep at least some academic activity and within it a bit of freedom which still can exist and survive in order that when there is an opening, we don't know when, in the future, we don't know when, when there is something opening, this tiny, tiny survival of academic freedom can be a support to develop and to re-elaborate upon collectively. When the war broke out, the response of the international community was to sanction Russia hard on almost all areas. And of course, uh, one of them was cutting the bonds to all official academic cooperation. And for many, this meant that they became cut off from the rest of the world while already being sort of an outsider in Russia. 
Um, so, so what are your thoughts on these sanctions, Julie? Paradoxically, although uh, the West is very united in in these sanctions, at least for now, um, these sanctions mean that uh, Russian academics who need to flee from Russia they cannot. Uh, because the flights are down and it's difficult to get a visa. And then in terms of uh, how uh, the sanctions have played out uh, in direct instructions to uh, the Norwegian Research uh, Council, for example, um, they have cut all institutional uh, collaboration. So no collaboration any longer Uh, between Norwegian institutions and Russian institutions. They have, however, uh, been careful to say that we actually encourage staying in contact with individual researchers. But I think those practices are uh, are different in different countries. So I think in the UK, the response has been much broader. So you've had the suspension of those links between institutions, but the UK government actually ordered uh, what they said all payments for projects delivered through UK public research funds, which is a lot of the kind of broad research domain, with a Russia dimension have been paused. So that's quite a broad uh, understanding. And mm. they've tried to make this distinction that they want to focus on projects that actually benefit the Russian state, that they don't want to target individual Russian scientists and so forth. But actually, they've gone, in practice, they've gone much broader than that. And even though they talk about suspending initiatives, in reality, everyone makes, pre once you get that kind of signal, everyone makes those preparations that they're not going to resume. And, and, and so effectively, It's it's cutting off those ties. It's cutting off those mm. those links, not only between institutions, but with individuals who are involved in specific projects. So there have been Russian academics who have been disinvited from conferences, for example, not because of something they've done, not because of something they've said, not because they've signed letters or their rectors have signed letters, simply for the fact of being Russian. Mm. So I think we do need to acknowledge that there are these very essentially racist tendencies within academia as well as in broader society and and the consequences of that and i think what people need to be wary of in making those calls is you're not just going to be punishing people who are pro putin you're also going to be punishing people who have been working for years if not decades on civil society democratization human rights really important work, work that we ourselves consider importance in this kind of Western framing of the conflict, and you're punishing them too. Mm. And, you know, collective punishment is, is illegal in a military context. It's immoral in a military context. Why do we then accept collective punishment in any other domain? Why should we accept it in, in kind of political life, social life? I guess it's also an issue that Western acad academics are now cut off from Russia. I guess you've lost a lot of important channels for information. And, you know, it's now 144 million people that we really don't know exactly what's happening to or what's going on. You know, what, what consequences does this have from a research perspective? I think it has um, enormous uh, consequences for me. I have not been able to travel to Russia for, for quite a few years. And uh, the contact is really important because you want to hear it from people who live there. You want to be there uh, to understand what the situation um, is like. Uh, and then there's the second layer, which comes uh, with this war, actually. And it's the amount of, it, it's the polarized picture where everything is black and white, particularly in Russia, of course, because now that the, the independent media are coming down, we're left with studying Russian <laughs> propaganda. Uh, we're not going to be following a newspaper like Nova Gazeta because they're not uh, telling us anything uh, anymore. It's simply... Uh, um, And that's actually been a problem for many years. What sources do I trust? Uh, I find myself in a situation where I hardly trust any source. And even on, on this war, uh, the weeks which have uh, passed, 
I have given some comments, for example, on the, of course, very interesting and catchy <laughs> uh, description for a newspaper of a war within uh, the war, namely Chechens, Kadyrovci fighting on the Russian side, meeting diaspora Chechens, to use that word, fighting on uh, the, the Ukrainian side. And in a way, it's a way for exiled Chechens to f to fight the terrible Kadyrov regime. So this has been a story which they really want in most Western newspapers. But then recently we found out through somebody who knows more, who we're now not going to be able to be in contact with, that actually there are very few Kadyrovci in Ukraine because Kadyrov doesn't want to sacrifice his Kadyrovci. Rather, the Chechens who are uh, in Ukraine are people who are, have been taken out uh, of prison and been given a choice. Do you, do you want to fight the war or do you want to stay in prison and face torture? So this is the type of nuance uh, which is really important and which we as researchers, you know, we do not want to contribute to fake news, but the fact that I, we have already during these weeks, you know, commented on the fact of Kadyrovci and these other Chechens fighting on the other side is in a way then reproducing fake news because we don't know and we're not going to have contact with those sources uh, who can tell us that actually the picture is pretty different. There's always this danger that you end up talking about the country that existed when you were there when you last had good access to information, that you end up replicating these ideas about the Kadyrovsi, which are based on essentially their prowess in the Chechen wars and ignoring how much the, the, the composition of those Kadyrovsi have changed over time and so mm. forth and so forth. Mm. So there's a real danger, not only that we become more isolated, but that our views become really stagnant and we don't actually even know it because we're mm. just losing those sources of information and ability and those connections with our colleagues. And of course, I agree with what uh, Mark uh, said, that if we don't have this permanent link, this permanent feeling, this permanent exchange to feel the mood, to feel the atmosphere, and of course the access to the field, to carry out uh, real social science research on the field. I don't know what kind of research we will be able to, to carry out. We are approaching the end of uh, today's podcast, but I, you know, you all have extensive expertise on the North Caucasus. So I feel it's, it's natural to pick up on this in this context that we're talking about today. Um, so are there any parallels to what's happening in Russia today and what's been going on for years in, in the North Caucasus? Uh, yes and no. I think all three of us, independently of each other, made this comment that what we have been seeing in the North Caucasus, the repression and the silence and the impossibility of uh, doing your work and expressing yourself, now concerns the whole of Russia. And it's really been shocking because we have always been working on a very special case. But then suddenly it feels like it's not a very special uh, space in Russia. It is what it looks like uh, in Russia. But then there are still differences which we need to keep in mind. One is, you know, the, the Kadyrov regime in um, in Chechnya is an extremely violent and repressive regime and has been for many years so I have a feeling that although now there is a martial law type situation and it, it really is putting into black <laughs> uh, the public space uh, in Russia, what Mark was talking about, you know, the, the ability of Russian civil society to try to work around the hurdles which are placed in their ways, the practices they have, and actually the, the culture that Russian intellectuals have of uh, dissent and trying to uh, find a voice and, uh, and use it. I, I have a feeling that that will maybe when the war is over, although we're going to be at uh, in a different place than we were before the war, 
uh, there might be some space and that there is going to be some more potential for um, these people, both academics and intellectuals, to work. So yes and no. It's Chechnya, but still there's a different potential there. And it's interesting also to see that actually the colleagues who have been working on uh, Chechnya in particular are uh, and on human rights issues and, and so on, they are actually the people who immediately say, we will not leave Russia, we will not flee, because they also have the tools and know how to survive and, and do their job even under these terrible conditions. I mean, Aud used the phrase Chechenization of Russia, and I think that's one that we've all kind of come to to, to explain this, this phenomenon as some of the... There's a lot of practices that have been tried out in the North Caucasus first and then they get replicated. So talking about the the gathering of state employees and students at the stadium to, to express their support for the war, being compelled through their employers to actually participate. And these are things that we've seen in, in mm. Chechnya for years. The, the brutal suppression of protests, the violations of human rights. I mean, there was a quote, I think it was from Dmitry Moratov, who's the uh, chief editor of Nova Gazeta, who recently won the Nobel Peace Prize, that Russian democracy died in the cradle in Chechnya. Uh, and I think there's been this slow erosion of Russian democracy that through this suppression of freedom of speech, through through the, that, that Chechen uh, prison. Mm -hmm. But I also kind of agree that in some ways, I guess, the situation isn't as bleak for the North Caucasus because the deterioration recently hasn't been as rapid because it was worse before. And so that means that people who are working in and around the region do have these experiences, these practices, this knowledge of how you navigate this area. So, um, of course, it's impossible to predict the future, but, you know, drawing on your expertise and uh, similar incidents does happen, for instance, in North Caucasus, if you can draw some lines, at least, uh, to what's happening in Russia. Um, what does the future of academic freedom in Russia look like, you think? So in 2018, we organized at the Brussels University, the French speaking one, the Université Libre de Bruxelles, we organized a, a large conference on academic freedom in general. And we invited Yuri Dmitriev, who is a historian. He is a historian of Memorial and is one of the very serious, rigorous, famous historians who worked very precisely and with an academic rigorness about excavations of uh, killed uh, people during uh, by the NKVD forces in Karelia, in the north of, of Russia. And uh, Russia created an official society of military history, and this uh, official society of military history is denying all the work of Yuri Dmitriev, and he is he is very heavily punished for his work as a free uh, historian he's in jail he's condemned for 13 years and he could not come he could not make it but he sent a letter and in his letter he ends up his letter writing that i am convinced i am sure that academic freedom won't never die and that it will it will survive and it will be uh, everywhere in the future as for future we can't say what will happen i just wanted to pay a tribute to those who are fighting who are working who are very sincerely precisely and honestly doing their job of research as for the future will it be better in 30 years or in six months, we can't uh, say that. There are many parameters and the equation is quite complex. Mm -hmm. So I uh, wouldn't dare to make any prognosis. If we want a prognosis that's not entirely bleak, I would agree, agree with that idea that you can't actually kill academic freedom. And I think a lot of our Russian colleagues are very experienced, as we've said, about navigating the rules of the system, striking a balance 
learning how to play the game, subvert the system in very subtle ways. And once the the rules of the game become clearer, once they become more stabilized, then I think academics will will learn how to do that and relearn how to do that. And, and so I don't I don't think you can kill academic freedom, but I think that then places the onus on us in the West not to push them into that black and white picture saying, well, you must take a clear stance, removing the gray space in which they can then operate and then they can uh, find that space to to operate and, and still do very good work because we know a lot of very good colleagues who are doing a lot of good work and we want to support them as much as we can, but the way to do that isn't by going for this black and white good versus evil. It's about maintaining these links, keeping that little shed of light, those contacts so that you can then grow something better so that when the Russian Academy wants to kind of start rebuilding that process that it's gone through for the last 30 years, then then we're in a position to support them. But I, I, I absolutely agree that it's not entirely bleak well then i think we should end on that slightly optimistic note uh thank you so much uh, old mark and julie for joining the world stage today thank you tschüss and tschüss